Well, we're in this summer series, about half done now, and talking about how to abide in Christ, how to remain in Him, how to have a strong spiritual life. And to, to look at this, we're uh, looking at really the, the biology of life. And, and in that, we, we're having some comparisons between our, our spiritual health and our physical health. And what we learn is that for something to be alive, there are seven things that have to be present. And we're going through those seven, and, and we've talked about respiration, you know, and we talked about nutrition, and those two things are prayer and Bible. And then last week we had sensitivity, and today we've got movement, and there's growth coming, and there's uh, reproduction, and then the one you're all waiting for, excretion, you know, which is like, what are we going to do with that? Okay. Yeah, that's really... You know, it sounds weird, but that's that's really a, a great and an important thing is to get rid of some stuff. All right, so today we're talking about movement. If it's alive, there's going to be movement, right? If something is alive, it's going to move. It may be just cellular, but there's going to be some kind of movement in everything that's alive. And today in America, what I thought about, first of all, is that there are millions of people, and we may not know any, but there are millions of people who never leave the confines of their home. Some of them never leave the confines of their bedroom. And uh, for multiple reasons, but they, they haven't left for years and they have friends that will come visit them and friends that will bring them food. And of course, because of the internet, you can order anything on the internet and, and have it delivered to your house. And, and you can communicate with people, actually have relationships with people uh, and never leave your house. And uh, some of them suffer from agoraphobia, which is, you know, fear of, of crowds. And, and others are just have psychological problems and uh, panic attacks or, or depression. And it makes it really difficult because they can't, uh, difficult getting treatment because they won't leave their home. So, you know, the days are gone for doctors to make house visits. So they just stay put and their movement extraordinarily limited and treatment is difficult. Animals sometimes will kind of freeze and stay put. We've got a rabbit in our backyard, and uh, usually when you walk out and the rabbit's there and he sees you and he runs, you know, he's just a little bitty guy. He lives under our porch with a ground squirrel, a groundhog, and what else have we got? they, they got their own little city underneath our porch there. So, it's a marmise anyway, but the, the rabbit, sometimes he'll just freeze. He just sits there, you know, and nothing moves on him, he thinks. You can't see me if I won't, if I don't move. And of course, we've all probably seen a possum in our life. Our possums beautiful animals. I mean, it's just like, this is a possum that's playing possum. And this is one of their defense mechanisms is that when they're threatened, they're, they can't run. You know, they just kind of waddle. They can't run away and they're not strong. So they just pretend to already be dead. And they'll just fall down the ground and play possum is, is uh, where that comes from. And I remember one time that uh, I walked out the back door, not in the house we live, but another house, and there was a possum on the deck. And, you know, he just kind of dropped down. He's like, okay, I'm dead. You know, you know, just walk on by, nothing to see here. And I got a broom and I started poking him. And then I found out that he has another uh, defense mechanism, and that's called ugly. <laughs> Because possums are so ugly, they hiss at you and they got these teeth. It's like, man, this, you know, God says, okay, when I make you, you can play dead and you can be ugly, but you can't cross the road because of cars, right? Just, just, just forget about that. So have you ever froze in life? Have you ever just kind of stalled out? Um, I remember a time and I had to go back for this and, um, you know, time when I hardly went out of the apartment for, for months. And I was 20 years old. I was kind of in college. I'd signed up for classes, let's put it that way. And let's just say, because of my sin and because of my lifestyle, I had lost every friend that I had besides Nina. Nina was the only friend that I had. All the guys that were my close friends. I'm not going to tell you anymore. You can just make something up if you want to there. But nobody would have anything to do with me. And uh, they were all afraid of me. And so 
I just kind of went into my cave and Nina would get up in the morning and she would go to work and leave me there. I would self-medicate and then watch soap operas all day. That all went on for months. And so we talk about freezing or stalling out in life. I know what it's like to have your hope tank so depleted and to not be able to see what tomorrow might bring to the point that you just crawl in the cave and just pretend to be dead because that's what I was doing. And that went on uh, for quite a while before it stopped. This has got a lot to do, really, with abiding in Jesus because the life of faith is about movement. It's about action. Remember that Jesus told his followers in John 15 that they were to remain in him, they were to abide in him, that they were the branches and he was the vine and they would bear fruit as they were attached. And, I mean, it's so easy for us to live as if our faith life is just about my thoughts and just about my intentions. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So let's revisit that. John 15, 5. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I just kind of changed the text there. Uh, made it a different color. So those two words would stand out to us. That we would bear fruit. That's action. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing, which implies that apart that with him, we can do anything, okay? If we are in Christ, there's going to be some fruit. There's going to be some action. Apart from him, we can do nothing. Attached from him, abiding in Christ, yes. There's all kinds of things. We can do everything. It's action. It's movement. But I think often in life uh, we develop nerve damage where there's a disconnect between what we think and what we do. People believe that faith in God and following a Christ is about our thoughts. And it's, it's true that our thoughts are extremely important, but the actions come out of thoughts. All right? And if there's no action, thought by itself is not enough. God wants to renew our minds, but, but right thoughts result in right actions. We do something. We have to have actions of faith, not just mere thoughts of faith or intentions. And I think that the nerve damage, the disconnect is, is so rampant today. People think that, you know, as we, that love is just an emotion. Love isn't just an emotion. Love's an action. We all know that. Uh, people believe that if they intend to do something, that it's just as good as if they actually did it. Well, I intended to go. I intended to help, but I didn't get it done. And they think, well, that's almost as good. But we have to act. We have to move. And often there's a disconnect. We think that doing something, we almost do something. We thought about doing something. And maybe we procrastinate or, or we just don't get around to it. Or maybe we're, we're uncertain and we, we want to wait and be absolutely 100% sure but unless we act, we have movement, we're not alive in Christ. We're, we're not abiding in Him and we're not healthy. Because if we really believe in Him and we are really seeking to follow Him, then our thoughts and intentions are going to turn into actions. I ran across a philosopher, John Locke. He's a Lockean philosopher. He actually was... Uh, one of the philosophers that the whole modern era really came from. And, and this is his statement. He says, I have always thought that the actions of men are the best interpreters of their thoughts. That's true. What we do shows what's going on in our head. There's so many examples in the Bible about this. I'm not going to go through all of them, of course. But uh, the, the classic example is of the Israelites and I keep going back to them in this series for some reason. I'm kind of stuck on the Israelites and, and the wilderness, but I think it's there for us to learn from. And they just left Egypt, and they've arrived at the Red Sea, and it says that Pharaoh changes his mind, and he says, what have I done? I've let them go. Go get them. So all of his mighty warriors get in their chariots, you know, and they, like a Humvee today, and they, they tear out after the poor Israelites. And, and I mean, the... There they are at the Red Sea, and they, they see the Israelites coming, and they're paralyzed. They, they don't know what to do. And just, just earlier, just days before this, it had so much faith. When they were 
kind of plundering the Egyptians, God says, take their gold and their silver. So, man, they took their gold and their silver. And you got to get the picture right here. You know, we, we see these movies about this whole scene of the Israelites leaving, and it's like Charleston Heston and about 50 guys, you know. There's about a million and a half people. I think that's a really pretty accurate estimate. The lowest estimates ever for the Israelites coming out of Egypt are 600,000. That's a lot of people. I mean, that's a throng of people. And it says that they were traveling in military array, in martial array. That, that, that means that they had all their flags out for their tribes and their clans. And man, they're showing their stuff. You know, we are God's people. Look at us. And then, you know, they come to the, the, the Red Sea and they can't cross because it's not parted yet. And they see the dust of the, of the, Israel, or the Egyptians coming in their chariots and, and they go into that moaning, complaining thing that they learn how to do so much. And they go, wow, we didn't want to come. Why did you bring us out here far? We wanted to stay where we were. You know, this is all. We didn't want to leave. We're not soldiers. We're not fighters. We, we build pyramids is what we do. We don't fight people. We don't want to leave. We're going to die. Now, as they're saying that, remember that over their camp in the daytime, there's this pillar of cloud that is going up over them, symbolic of the captain of the army, the, the angel of the Lord. At night, it's, it's a pillar of a fire that rises. So here they are. They have this, you know, they see the presence of God among them, and yet they've, they've got no faith, and they're stuck. They can't go back. They're going to kill them. And they can't go forward because the sea's there. So this is what, what, what the Scripture says, Exodus 14, 13 to 14. And Moses said to the people, this is Moses, Fear not, stand firm, see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Sounds like a good word, doesn't it? Sounds like something God would say. Stand firm, be strong. God's going to do this whole thing. Not exactly what God had in mind. The next verse, Exodus 14, 15. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. <laughs> tell them to go into the Red Sea. Move, is what he tells them. Don't tell me. Tell them to move. Go forward. I, you know, often we're afraid to, to move. Uh, it's strange how, how often at times when it seems that movement and action, when something happens in life and we know that something has to change, we think, well, this would just be natural. This is a no-brainer. And yet, Oftentimes we become paralyzed, and we even in the midst of severe trauma, and we just can't do anything. Amanda Ripley investigated why people, um, some people survive disasters, others don't, and she investigated all these disasters: fires and floods, and hurricanes, and airplane crashes, and she interviewed dozens of survivors, and she found three phases to the journey from danger to safety. The first one was denial. Nothing's going on here. The second one was deliberation. What should I do? And the third one was be called that called that decisive moment. And unfortunately, many people don't make it to the decisive moment, to the third phase, because they die before they ever get there. They're in denial the whole time. As an example of that in her book, she told the story of Paul Heck. He's a man who had decisive action and back in, in 1977 Mr. Heck was 65 years old and his wife and his wife were sitting in a Pan Am 747 and an incoming plane uh, came through the fog about 160 miles an hour and slammed into their plane as they're sitting there on the tarmac and the collision sheared off the top of this 747 and the whole plane caught fire Okay, and most of the hope oh, nobody's flying this week. Most of the 396 passengers on board froze. Everybody just sat there in their seats. Even Heck's wife, she didn't do anything. She just sat there. As the top of the plane's gone, it's on fire. Smoke is filling up the cabin. 
but nobody does anything. Everybody, according to her, she says that she just went blank. She just felt like a zombie, didn't know what to do. He went into the action mode. He unbuckled his seatbelt. He grabbed his wife's hand. He said, follow me. And then he led her out the hole in the side of the, of the fuselage. Interview after the disaster, Mr. Heck noted how much people just sat in their seats acting like everything was fine, even after colliding with the plane and having the top of the fuselage torn apart. But he was prepared. It's a fact. Most serious times of life, many people refuse to move. They're just... Maybe we're behind on the mortgage, but we just let those things stack up until we finally get the eviction notice. We don't do anything about it. Or we know something's wrong with our body, but we don't go to the doctor. Okay, we're scared. We don't know what to do, so we just go on and on pretending that, you know, we're in denial, that nothing's going to happen. It's fear. At that decisive moment, we do nothing. And God says, go forward. Don't just stand there. Go forward. Move. Act. It's time. If you don't act, you're going to die. Every living thing has movement. If you aren't moving, you're dead. Now, the New Testament example, I think, teaches us the importance of movement. Uh, with Jesus and the man who sat beside the pool waiting to be healed. I love this passage of Scripture, this story. It's in John 5, 1-9. I'll read it for us quickly. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool an Aramaic called Bethesda, which has, a, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multiple of invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. Some of your Bible translations will, will have some additional scriptures in there explaining what this all means. It's a later edition, but anyway. Uh, Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. 38 years. It's a long time to be paralyzed. It's a long time to sit by a pool and wait for a miracle, isn't it? 38 years. And the question asked by Jesus is not rhetorical. I mean, do you want to be healed? Uh, do you want to move? Uh, do you want things to change? It sounds a little bit insensitive, I know, but he sees inside this man. He knows what's going on with this man because this man says, well, I have my reasons. I can't get into the water like everybody else. Everybody else is quicker than me. You see, the thing was, is they thought that, that when the water stirred, an angel had stirred the water and the first one in gets healed. And so that's what this man says. Jesus just says, get up, get up, take up your bed and walk. And he did. Muscles that had not been connected, there'd been nerve damage, Okay? had not been connected for 38 years, suddenly come to life and he begins to walk. But he had to stand up himself. No one can move for him. He had to do it himself, you see. He had to obey what Jesus had told him to do. He had to do it. Now, I do think that God stimulates us to move. Um, there are times when he, his word when we're reading a Bible passage and it just, as we were saying a couple weeks ago, it's living and active, it cuts in deep to us and it means something to us and we go, wow, I see that now. And it's revelation, a passage comes to life, it's a word from God. And we know that we can't stay where we are, but now it's time to move. Sometimes God does that with his word. And similar is, is just a word from the Holy Spirit. Often God will speak to us in the spirit and the stillness of our hearts. And we know God's heart and God's plan and we see. And God doesn't lay out for us a diagram of you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this. But he tells us what the next step is. You need to do this. Once we take the next step, we then see what the step is after that. And we see what the step is after that. But just like the Israelites setting their feet down in the Red Sea, 
we don't know it's going to part for certain until we take that step. But the Holy Spirit tells us and, and uses the word too. And, and, you know, he tells us what to do the first step. And then we take the next one. And, and right now, you know, someone's thinking, well, I, I'm not certain of his word to me. Well, join the crowd. Never are we 100% certain. That's what's called faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Okay? God doesn't give us this master plan of life, of everything that we must do to make our lives go well. But as, as you act in faith, as you take that first step, you're going to gain um, kind of a humble confidence that God is in fact leading you because the first step was okay. So the next step you'll be listening to and you will grow in your proficiency of movement and action and trust more and more as to what he says. Years ago, I walked into a, a man's office. I was just a young pastor many, many, many years ago. And uh, not quite that many, but walked into a man's office and I didn't know him, and I told him that God wanted him to sell the church that I was serving a piece of property that he had. That's rather arrogant, isn't it? You walk in some guy's office and say, God's told me that he wants to sell that he wants you to sell your property to us. We had wanted the property. We had waited for quite a while and uh, asking before and nothing had happened. But, but I did. I, I really thought I heard from God that God wanted him to sell it. And so just being young and ignorant and a little arrogant, probably, I walked in and I told him that. And he sat there for a minute. He says, you know, I think you're right. I think you're right. I think God does want me to sell that to you. Within a month, it was ours. Okay. So I went back and told the board and they, you know, they were going to make me businessman of the year or something. He, he, well, the, the great, the worst thing that could have happened would have, would have been that he would have said no. And he would have told that at Kiwanis club that week that the young preacher down at first Christian, uh, he doesn't know anything. And he actually walked to my office and told me that God had told him and I would have been the laughing stock of the town, but it didn't work out that way. Instead, he said yes, because he was listening too, see, and God had prepared him for me to walk into his office. When I told the, the church board, they said, well, you need to run our business. You know, they were kind of, you know, being a little sarcastic there, I think. But uh, I said, oh, it's, no, it's God. They said, yeah, 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 Don, that's nice. Isn't that nice? God told you that. There's a time to act. Had I waited, I would have lost that time. And that's probably the only good story that I can think of where I actually acted on time when I was supposed to. Okay? But there is a time to act. And God will often tell us if we're listening, if we abide. But the other way that God stimulates us to move is with pressure. When we are stuck, when we're paralyzed, unwilling to, or unable to move, God often exerts pressure that feels negative in our lives. This isn't a happy moment. This is feels like, like it's something bad that's being applied into our life. And, you know, most of the time, if you consider how we move and how we learn, most of the time it's this pressure that's applied to our lives. The early church um, was told by Jesus to go, the, the Great Commission. Go, therefore, into all the world. Make disciples, right? Well, he said, wait here in Jerusalem, you'll receive power. But after you've received that power, you're to go into the entire world. Start here in Jerusalem and then, you know, Judea, the further area, and then the whole world is where you're to go. And, and they waited and they received this power and the church just exploded. They had like 5,000 converts the first couple months. 5,000 converts from being you know, people that were considered to be nobodies, just, you know, kind of rednecks from Galilee. Here, these apostles now were the head of this mega church that was exploding in Jerusalem. I mean, it's just God was blessing them so much, but God had told them to go and they didn't go. So what happens next in the story is there's this man that arises named Saul. 
And Saul's purpose is to persecute the young church. And so he starts killing them. First Stephen, then others. So the church had to move. <laughs> the church had to go kind of underground. They could no longer just be out in public identified as Christians because now they had persecution among them. And we look back on that and we go, well, that was that persecution was allowed by God's hand to put some pressure on the church so they would go other places. And, and later when the apostles and Paul would get into a city anywhere in the Mediterranean, they would come there, there would be some believers there because they had scattered from Jerusalem. You know, the apostles still maintained a church there, but it was pressure that forced them to do what God wanted them to do. Often a negative stimuli, often it's what gets us moving and forms our character as well as God pushes us to the next step in life. John Ortberg uh, argues that sometimes stressful and painful situations can actually help us grow. And he creates the, the following scenario. This is painful, okay? He says, imagine that you're handed a script of your newborn child's entire life. And better, you're given an eraser and you've got five minutes to erase anything from this life that you want to erase. And you read that this, this child that you've just been born is going to have a learning disability, is not going to be able to early on in elementary school learn like the rest of the children. In high school, she's, she's gonna make a great circle of friends, but one of her closest friends is gonna die of cancer. And after high school, she'll get into the college that she wants to go, but while she's there, she'll have a car accident and she'll lose a leg in the car accident. Now, following that, she's going to go through a difficult depression. And a few years later, she's going to get a great job only to be downsized out of that job. And she's going to fall in love and get married. And it's going to be a rough marriage and she's going to be separated. So what Orberg does, he says, if you could erase every failure, every disappointment and period of suffering, would that be a good idea for this child? Would you go through that child's life and erase everything, every negative push on her life, everything that she's going to suffer? Would that cause her to grow by not having this pressure into the person that God wants her to be? Or is she better off having the pressure? in life to get her to move. All the adversity and the setbacks and crisis and trauma to stimulate her to move onward. And Ortberg, and I agree with him, contends that God doesn't always erase all of our stress and pain before it starts. Instead, God uses our failures and our epic failures, sometimes our disappointments and our, our periods of suffering to help us grow. And he says, God isn't at work producing the circumstances I want. God is at work in bad circumstances to produce the me he wants. Isn't that a great line? So what's going on in our lives right now that's pushing us, okay? That we may think this is terrible. It may actually be a push from God to get us to move into something, get us to act in faith. Today, maybe some of us are frozen. I don't know. Maybe some of us are playing possum, just stalled out, afraid. Maybe you're watching soap operas all day uh, like I did. We know that things can't stay the, the way that they are. Life is about change. Life is about move. The pressure that we feel may, in fact, be the hand of God because God knows the end from the beginning and God knows us like Jesus knew the man beside the pool God knows who we really are and God knows who we can be and God applies the pressure let's sit in prayer with that for a minute
a fountain Dip your heart in the streams of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy As deep cries out